and welcome to this week's Batten Hour. My name is Ian Solomon, and I am the Dean of the Frank Batten School of Leadership and Public Policy. And as we start this new week, I am grateful for the opportunity to come together as a community to listen, to learn, to engage with those on the front lines of policy and leadership. And I'm especially delighted to provide the introduction for this morning's very special guest, His Excellency Philippe Etienne, Ambassador of France to the United States. A little bit of a history lesson here. In the year 1778, 243 years ago, the United States sent its first minister to the court of Versailles. Some of you may have heard of him, a man by the name of Benjamin Franklin. His successor should also be known to all of us here, Thomas Jefferson, who served in that role for more than four years. And so much has been written about Jefferson's time in Paris that it could probably occupy an entire class. In fact, it has a course called Jefferson and Paris was offered by the university just a few years ago. And for us here in Virginia, the influence of that time is seen all around us. For instance, during his time as ambassador, Jefferson was commissioned to design the state capital of Virginia. He recruited French architect Charles Louis Clarisseau to the project, and the pair based their designs on the Maison Carré, a classical Roman temple in Nimes, France. And here on central grounds of UVA, the influence of French architecture is undeniable. Among historians, a popular candidate for the inspiration of the architecture and design of the lawn and the pavilions was the Royal Chateau de Marly retreat, which Jefferson visited in 1786. You know, it's a rectangular design with the central building at the head and six pavilions on each of two sides connected by trellises and paintings of the retreat certainly bring to mind images of UVA's own academical village. And as the current resident of Pavilion 10 here on the lawn, I sometimes tell people that my home was inspired by Thomas Jefferson's visits to Louis XIV's retreat in Paris. And when Jefferson left the ambassadorship in 1789, he was succeeded in that role by some of the most distinguished public servants of their time, including future President James Monroe, Governor Morris, and Albert Gallatin. In other words, for more than two centuries, the United States and France each have sent their best to serve as ambassadors to the other. And our speaker today serves admirably within that tradition. It is an honor for me to welcome Philippe Etienne to the University of Virginia. While this visit, like most these days, is virtual, I do hope and expect that we will welcome him here, here in person in the not too distant future. Ambassador Etienne has held numerous posts within the Ministry for Europe and Foreign Affairs, notably including Ambassador of France to Romania, Director of the Cabinet of the Minister of Foreign and European Affairs, Permanent Representative of France to the European Union, Ambassador of France to Germany, and most recently, Diplomatic Advisor to the President. He is an expert on the European Union and continental Europe. He's held posts in Moscow, Belgrade, Bucharest, Bonn, Berlin, and Brussels. He's also served as an advisor in the cabinet to the Minister of Foreign Affairs on several occasions. He's a graduate of the Ecole Normale Supérieure and the Ecole Nationale d'Administration. Ambassador Etienne also holds a diploma in mathematics, a degree in economics, and is a graduate of the National Institute for Oriental Languages and Civilizations, where he studied Serbo-Croatian. He's an officer of the Legion of Honor and a commander of the National Order of Merit. Once again, Your Excellency, Thank you and welcome to the Batten School. It's my pleasure to turn over this program to one of our distinguished graduate students, Sean Bailoski, who will moderate this morning's conversation. Sean? Thank you so much, Dean Solomon. I really am, am very honored that the Batten School asked me to be a part of, of this event. And Mr. Ambassador, it, it truly is a pleasure to get to, to speak with you for this hour. Just a couple logistics before we get started. Uh, you'll notice that there is a Q&A box. So if you have any questions, 
throughout this this conversation, please do not hesitate to put them in the in the Q and A box as you think of them. We will uh, have a, have a discussion between the two of us for about twenty to thirty minutes, and then we'll open it up right around noon for Q and A. So we'll leave plenty of time to get to your questions. Well, Mr. Ambassador, I, I wanted to. Uh, that was a great introduction from Dean Solomon, and obviously very accomplished both you know in your academic, and then also you know with within your professional within your professional life, and you have been serving in diplomatic roles for, for four decades now. So just a very simple question, you know, what, what kind of drew you to this line of work? Well, th thank you first for having me and uh, thank you, Dean uh, Solomon. I'm uh, really pleased to be uh, uh, invited by such a prestigious uh, uh, institution like the Frank Batten School of Leadership and Public Policy and by the U University of Virginia. Actually, I have a secret I have to reveal now, I have been already on your campus. Uh, I visited Monticello with my wife and we, we went to the University of Virginia in Charlottesville and we visited the campus, but it was closed of course, and we were like um, tourists. And I was very much impressed by uh, what uh, your Dean uh, said about the influence of uh, Thomas Jefferson, of course, which uh, which means very much for the history of our cooperation and friendship. But I was also very moved by the monument your university has um, built in memory of the slaves, uh, who, who the enslaved men who have uh, uh, contributed to the construction of your university. And uh, I was uh, very, men and women, I was very, very much touched by this. Uh, uh, this monument. So I, I really look forward to visiting you in, in person and to, because I realize you are one of the uh, boss, best, uh, best universities, especially public universities for research. And I, I'm grateful to my colleague, uh, Vincent Michelot, Professor Michelot, who has uh, uh, proposed this, uh, this um, uh, contact. And I, I must also to, to stress at the beginning of our conversation that for me as ambassador of France to the United States, this, um, uh, this kind of contacts with, with uh, American universities, it's absolutely essential. It's uh, one of the big priorities of my job as ambassador. At least I see this uh, as something really, really important for me. So thank you for the invitation. And uh, to come back to your first question, uh, as um, the dean was kind to say, I, um, initially I studied mathematics. I was uh, trained as a mathematician, so it was not obvious to 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 be diplomat. But I was always uh, fascinated by history, the history of uh, uh, our nations, and um, uh, I also uh, like very much to to learn uh, foreign languages. So. I decided to try to, 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 to become a diplomat, so it worked well, and uh, uh, it was my, my, pre, my, my primary goal was really to, to serve my country as a, uh, uh, in the civil service of my country, but also to, to get to, to understand the, the world and the, the relations between France and uh, um, the, the world as it stood at that time, it was quite a different world. I, I became a diplomat in uh, 1980 uh, at the end of uh, the president, president of France was still Valéry Giscard d'Estaing. It was one year because before the big, uh, big uh, political change with the election of a socialist uh, president, François Mitterrand, who was the first government, whose first government was a combination of socialist and communist ministers. So it was just before that. But it was also at a time where the Soviet Union was still um, at um, a very, no, nobody, nobody uh, made any better on, on, the, on the end of the Soviet Union, of course. And, uh, uh, although it was already the time of uh, what the Russians would call later Zasto, it's a certain stagnation with uh, the end of the time of Leonid Brezhnev. It was something uh, which, uh, well, nobody could foresee what would happen in the uh, 10 to 12 uh, so following years. Well, and, and your first post was in, uh, in 1981, was in Belgrade, which was in communist Yugoslavia at the time. And I'm curious, how, how did that first post kind of really influence the, the rest of your career? Very much indeed, because um, I, I, I served in a country, Yugoslavia, which uh, 
uh, actually uh, 10 years later ceased uh, to exist, started to, 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 to crumble. And um, it has impressed me very much. And uh, looking backwards at what I lived, uh, what, what I could feel in, in this country, I really uh, had to reflect uh, upon uh, how things can change so quickly. Uh, but I also got to understand that I had seen some signals of what would happen in the former Yugoslavia. And it's really, it has learned, first I must say it was a fantastic experience. I, I love this country, but I'm prone to love all countries where I have served actually, because it's so, such, such a fantastic, uh, both as a young diplomat as I was in Yugoslavia, but also as ambassador now. It's so, so fantastic to have the opportunity to, to discover a country, culture, a language, a people. But I also, uh, looking backwards, lo looking, uh, pondering on what I had seen in, in Yugoslavia, um, I, I have seen signals of what, uh, what would happen, but I didn't understand them, of course, uh, or, or I didn't translate them into a reality. And nobody knew, nobody has foreseen the, that Yugoslavia would, uh, would uh, disappear. Some of those signals were in the field of culture. I remember some, uh, some, um, especially one theatre play in in Belgrade, and uh, reading some pieces of literature, which which were, in a way, uh, the the which announced uh, what would happen. So, I learned you have to look not only at the at the surface, but also. Uh, to to try to to take a look deeper through the culture is uh, which is sometimes more inter more interesting for for the situation the, 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 the understanding where you are than um, even economics or politics. So I, I know this to be true because I'm the oldest student at Batten. And so, I, um, you know, all the students you are addressing either uh, were not alive during the Cold War or have no working memory of the Cold War. And I'm wondering, how do you think that influences the younger generation of, of diplomats? And, and is that an advantage or a disadvantage? Well, first, history is matters very much. You have to understand where you, we are all coming from and uh, to understand the world especially in diplomacy uh, history is uh, absolutely crucial and you you cannot understand the world as it is for instance the relations between russia and the west uh, western democracies if you do not uh, uh, understand uh, if you don't know what happened before 1991 um i think that uh, the president of the Federation of Russia, Vladimir Putin said that the most tragical event in the history of Russia was uh, the way the, the Soviet Union uh, collapsed. And uh, it, you have to understand where this uh, we we are uh, um, coming from. Not only we, but also other nations and uh, other parts of the world with whom with which we have to we we, we with which we work. Uh, in a way, so though so, the the fact not to have been uh, to 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 have known uh, as a as a living diplomat or an active diplomat or even student the the, the cold war can help still because if you if you have for instance the relations with china the people who have been uh, already active uh, in, in the time at the end of the cold war they, they tend to compare the two of them and we say in French, comparison et paraison, comparison is not reason, which means that um, you, 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 you should not be feel obliged to, to compare two situations. So it can help, but I think you have to, I am sure your students do that. Uh, <laughs> uh, you have to understand the, the time of the Cold War to understand where we are now. As Dean Salman recounted, you know, you've spent a lot of your career in, in focused on maintaining and developing European relationships uh, on behalf of France. I, I was wondering if you could reflect on how that that role toward toward Europe has really evolved over the course of your career. You mean how Europe has evolved or how? Yeah, how, how your your role in, in developing and maintaining those re relationships within Europe have how, how that role has evolved over over the last. Uh, well, I have served. I have served three times, 13 years in 
in, in total in Brussels in the French permanent representation to the European Union. So, uh, and I worked also from Paris uh, quite a, a couple of times uh, in the European policies, French European policies. So uh, I was impressed by the way the European Union has evolved. I, I thank you for this question, by the way, because uh, Sean, because it's something I, we have to explain to Amer American audiences. Um, the uh, the European Union, uh, the the European project has been launched also with the support of the US because it was after the well the Second World War and at the beginning of the Cold War in 1950 by and it was uh, founded on the reconciliation between Germany and France and Germany, which is really something important to understand after three. Uh, real uh, terrible wars between the two nations and we have decided together um, exactly drawing the lessons from the end of the first world war to do exactly the contrary to, to go for true reconciliation uh, including the economic dimension and this project has been founded on sharing pooling pooling sovereignty and pooling resources coal and steel at the beginning, but more and more other policies. And this project has evolved to become real. It was political at the very beginning because of reconciliation, meaning we want to end wars between European neighbors. It was very political from the outset, but now it's a really political integration project. And it has evolved adapting itself to um, the changing international uh, situation and landscape. It has also adapted itself and it, it, it has grown through crisis. Each big international crisis, including recently the financial crisis, crisis uh, from uh, starting with the sub, subprime, subprime crisis in 2008, through the migration crisis and uh, up to the COVID crisis, through all those crises, the European project and integration project has uh, has grown and has developed. So uh, for me, it's really important. And one of the most important things is to explain this to our, uh, our American friends and to explain to them that for the United States itself, it's a very good thing that um, uh, Europe, this European um, union uh, becomes stronger because we are the two pillars of a very important alliance which is the transatlantic alliance and we are also the we we share values and especially are attached to democratic to the, the democracy to, to the values of freedom and democracy and to defend those values in a world which is of objectively more and more difficult, uh, we have to be stronger, the two of us have to be stronger. So the European Union tries to, to fulfill this uh, role. And of course, France is, uh, is uh, very, very keen to, uh, to develop this uh, integration uh, in, uh, in, in, in continuing to pool more and more our national sovereignties, which remain, and to build a true European sovereignty in the world as it is today. You kind of led into my next question when you mentioned about having to explain, you know, the, the concept, kind of the history to, to Americans. And so you became the, the ambassador of France to the United States in September of 2019. And so um, I'm just kind of wondering, how is dealing with the United States different from Europe or the, or the rest of the world for that matter? Well, the U.S. is the, 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 the biggest power in the world, the most important country. It's also a very special country with its uh, uh, history. And we are, of course, um, uh, Jordine mentioned it, uh, uh, we are, France is, is, is the oldest ally of the United States because we, uh, we for historical reasons, uh, we, we can explain. If you're, if you know, but I think you, everybody knows them. We we decided uh, to uh, to help the American insurgents uh, to to win their independence and uh, uh, the 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 support by by my country at this time was uh, decisive, of course, uh, up to Yorktown, uh, uh, the Battle of Yorktown, the siege and the, the victory in Yorktown. So 
both the US as such as is a, is a very special country, a unique country in the world with a special role. And the relation between France and the United States has always been very, very special. So it's something different to be here an ambassador than to be ambassador in other, in other countries, of course. Uh, but now it's still more uh, important in, and interesting, I think, because, because of the, the new challenges we have in the world. Uh, and especially uh, global challenges, uh, which uh, we all face, the pandemics, uh, the climate change, and also with uh, the, the rise of new powers, and uh, including of uh, powers which are not uh, democratic. So it's also a huge challenge. And in, in, uh, I want to transition a little bit to kind of the, the role of being a diplomat and, and what you've learned. And in, in 2018, Nicholas Kralov, he wrote an op-ed in the New York Times, and it was titled Diplomats Are Made, Not Born. And so his premise, obviously, is that there are skills that must be developed through experience. And what, what is it that you think sets apart great diplomats from, from good ones or decent ones? Well, it's not an easy question, but... Uh, um, because it, you, you have not two categories of uh, the real, really exceptional diplomats and the d good or distant ones. There is a continuity, I think. And you can be a very good diplomat at one time and a, a less, uh, a, a somewhat uh, um, a, bit, uh, a bit less uh, at another time. But I think the most important, I would say, is to, to have the capacity to to understand uh, the, the the deep uh, the deep meaning of a situation uh, and the the deep motivation of the the people your partners in a negotiation or it can be your uh, people threatening your country or uh, the, the, to this to have a clear sight of this it is based on knowledge it is based on experience. But it, it's sometimes also based on intuition and psychology and uh, a, a sort of a deep feeling of uh, things which are not uh, obvious, which are not written. Uh, because when when you speak uh, with representatives of other countries, uh, there is always a lot of uh, things which are not explicitly said even if in countries which are rather explicit, like the United States, uh, you, 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 and unconsciously, because uh, you, you, when you, sp you speak from a certain position, you speak from, uh, fr from the point, you have uh, your history, you have your mentality, you have culture, you, are, you have your interests. So all of this is something which we have to understand and, uh, and, uh, and uh, a very good diplomat is, uh, is somebody who is able to understand this and to adapt himself and to explain this to his government and to adapt his negotiations and to 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 this uh, and to be active to to uh, in taking into account all this uh, deep understanding so, so what is kind of building off that? What is the what's the hardest lesson you've had to learn on the job, and and, and how did that influence your career moving forward? Well, the most difficult experience you you can have as a diplomat is when uh, probably when you come to to uh, you are in you are in a negotiation and it doesn't work. So you are in a, you come to a dead end and you you have to to be. Um, uh, modest and to humble and to you it's like uh, you know uh, somebody who is in a, a bit uh, and like a craft craftsmanship you have to 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 be humble in in a way to in meaning that you have to restart everything sometime and uh, to to uh, to 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 start from the scratch again with a uh, um, and to understand where uh, and why the, the 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 negotiation you were committed to uh, failed, so it's um, it's quite um, important, and it's important to 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 go through such uh, such exper experiences. I think. So at Batten, we focus not just on policy, but but on leadership. And a big part of leadership that we discuss is the ability to influence, and and not just individuals, but systems. And so what have you learned over the course of your career about the most in uh, the most effective ways to influence at the systemic level? 
Well, <laughs> I think it, is it has been changing quite a lot with the development of uh, internet and the social media, and it's a, a challenge for diplomats belonging to my generation is uh, not only to, to understand the world, how, how, how the world is changing, but also to adapt to the new techniques, which uh, give you uh, a leverage and uh, ways to influence uh, more, more or less systematically your, uh, uh, the, the, uh, well, to, 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 to get this influence, this systemic influence you mentioned. Uh, so now I, I, I think that the, the, the way you work to reach this goal is are quite different. It's quite different from what it was uh, when I started. But one permanent uh, uh, in, instrument uh, or category of instruments is really communication. The, everything which has to do with, with communicating, the efficiency of your communication, both uh, interpersonal, uh, the, the, to have a good uh, um, um, uh, uh, a number of interlocutors which you trust in such a way that you, you can rely on what uh, what they tell you and uh, um, and to to have it to diversify it not to not to concentrate only on a on a certain level of uh, interlocutors but to to understand how to reach out to different uh, parts of the the system or the population, if we want to be very ambitious. Um, for instance, in the American system, uh, I, I, it's obvious that uh, you have to, to, to get to, to work with very, very closely with, uh, with the Congress, and not only with the government, or not only with the Congress, but also with the administration. The, the natural reflex is to get to the administration, of course, but you have to understand also um, how to work um, to to develop your contacts with the, with the Congress, and um, but again, I, I will end with uh, the beginning of my answer to your great question. Now it's very much with the social media and how to how to to work with them. Well, I have just a couple more questions before we turn it over to Q and A. And so, just remind folks if you have questions, put them in the Q and A box. I see see some there, and we'll get to those in just a second. But a, a simple but but broad question, Mr. Ambassador: Given all the challenges facing the globe right now, what keeps you up at night? <laughs> um, <laughs> I think to the the. the I try not to be kept up at night and to, to be able to renew my <laughs> energy in uh, working force as some, some would have uh, written. No, but I, I think that the first, we, with this new administration, my, my first goal, of course, is to establish a, a good relation with the new administration and uh, the people in charge. But then, um, Probably the most um, the most uh, the, the pressing issue is to get out of the pandemics and to how to, we can cooperate efficiently to uh, uh, to restart uh, um, in uh, in very safe uh, conditions uh, travels and business contacts cultural contacts cultural not my my concern is that we don't uh, because we had to take uh, precautions to to stop uh, uh, transatlantic travels for instance so we have these travel bans in, in place my, my 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 biggest concern probably is that we doing that we do not kill uh, um, some essential elements uh, of our uh, relation which are so strong in uh, in culture in uh, in business this is something which uh, I'm. Uh, I tried. Well, I I cannot do very much actually, but uh, it's a, it's a concern I have. Well, the last question before we we get to Q and A, and just again drawing on on the leadership theme, I'm curious. What's a leadership lesson that you've learned that you wish someone would have told you while you were a graduate student in university or or as as an undergraduate student? Well. Uh, <laughs> I don't know whether I am in a position to to say this, but uh, um, considering my own uh, performance, I mean, but uh, I I think the most important thing is to 
to to manage uh, your team to have a, to to you have to devote much much uh, importance to your team and to 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 lead uh, uh, means also to um, uh, to uh, to take much very much time in uh, in uh, with the people who work with you. I think it is the most important. Well, Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for that. And I'm going to start getting to some of the questions from um, from the audience members. And I'm going to start with I'm going to start with Kevin. And Kevin has a question. He says, uh, "Do you approach bilateral diplomatic relations differently than diplomacy through multilateral institutions such as the UN and NATO? And if so, how? And which will be more important in the decades to come?" Well, yes, uh, yes, of course, it is very different. Uh, but I think that you cannot say that one will be more important than the other because they are complementary. And you cannot make a good multilateral diplomacy if you are not able, as I said before, to understand the motivations, the goals of each of your, the other people around the table. If, even if there are many, many people around the table, let's take the example of the European Union since I served so many years in this framework. You have uh, now we are 27 nations. It's quite a lot, and in those nations, uh, among those nations, for a country like France, you have some countries which we 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 had lost uh, the contact with them when they were under the communist uh, di dictatorship and uh, and, uh, and uh, in the Soviet bloc. Um, we have to we have to to make efforts to 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 get to know them. So this is bilateral a bilateral understanding which is necessary to a good multilateral work. But having said that, the two, the two diplomacies are very different, of course. Uh, bilateral diplomacy is about um, bilateral negotiations, uh, uh, taking care of a bilateral relation in all fields, from culture, art, and science to uh, politics, and then through business investments and uh, military security cooperation. Uh, so you 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 have a um, a number of uh, domains, but you 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 find yourself always in the same cultural context and uh, with the same uh, uh, the two nations, uh, yours and. Uh, your partner. Uh, multilateralism is of course uh, different. You you can you will not go as deep into each uh, um, uh, bilateral each field, but you, you you have to, as I said, to 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 figure out how your your negotiating negotiation goals can be achieved, understanding the. The, the 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 geography or the, the cartography of the of the negotiation positions of all everybody being hopefully known you have to figure out how you you will uh, obtain you will reach the goals of your own uh, negotiation position um, navigating through these uh, different positions of uh, many other nations it's it's a really um, it's a thrill it's a thrill I, I, I I love to do that, but I love also to be in, in, a, in a bilateral relation. It's, it's not the same thing, of course, but both are absolutely fantastic. Our next question comes from Ethan. He says, building off your comments about the internet and social media, how do you see the field of diplomacy changing in the coming years? And will diplomacy in action be significantly different in the future when compared to the past because of social media and the internet? Yes, I think it is already very different. and. Uh, we we have to um, uh, to consider that uh, to 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 make our views known. We um, we have now plenty of opportunities, plenty of techniques we had not before. But everybody has them. So if you uh, you 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 have to be very active on on not only on the social media as they are now. But also to 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 understand that it will change uh, in the future. Your question is about the future, and it's right because uh, now we have Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and uh, many others. But what will we have? Uh, all of a sudden, you have a uh, new new uh, uh, new media, and so it's it's really. Uh, 
I, I don't know where we will be in 10 years, but uh, it's really a challenge for us to adapt ourselves to. And one of the key um, things to do is also to, not only to communicate on what you want to, to bring forward to your partners, uh, but also to, to look at the way you are doing it more and more. Because before, to even 20, 25 years ago, the, the, the methods were quite stable. Now it's, it is changing all the time. So a, part, a good part of your job will be not only to, to, to look at the substance of what uh, your, and, uh, but also to look at the, the way you are doing it because the efficiency of your, your work will be more and more um, a function of the, the way you are, the instruments you are using. It's a, it's a big change, I think. I, uh, you mentioned 10 years. I have uh, three children who will be teenagers in 10 years. So I'm, I'm nervous about what social media and the like will, will look like then. Mm -hmm. uh, our next question comes from Claire. And she says, how has France's membership in the European Union complicated its response to the COVID pandemic? Has the EU made vaccination efforts effort slower or more complicated in any way? No, I don't think so. We, we chose to, with other uh, European nations to uh order to negotiate with the vaccine manufacturers at the european level from the outset i think it was a good choice we had not to do this this way to do it this way because uh, legal aid is a competence which still belongs to the nations um the authorization of the vaccines and other of pharmaceuticals is at the european level legally it's it's a level level of competence which belongs already to a European level, but the to order uh, the vaccines was not necessarily uh, something we had to do at uh, at the European level. The choice to do it was uh, politically, um, of course, a very important, but technically it has also allowed us to have one single negotiation with each producer with Pfizer BioNTech with uh, Moderna with uh, Johnson and Johnson AstraZeneca and so on because there are new vaccines coming in, in the future so uh, and I think it has uh, avoided a lot of uh, uh, um, um, counter, con counterproductive competitions or disruptions among European countries so I think globally it was a good thing. What we didn't do uh, correctly, uh, or more precisely, what the US did, we 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 we, we couldn't do in in Europe, and we will do we will draw the lessons from this, is the uh, to the preparation and the the purchase in advance of many vaccines through uh, an institution you have in the United States, which which is Bardar and which, which uh, has uh, uh, enabled the United States to act uh, more quickly. And uh, of course, then after that, you have, a, as we see now, a huge logistics, uh, uh, which is uh, quite efficient since so many people are already vaccinated in, in, in the US. But in Europe, uh, especially in, in France, we are not, maybe we're one and a month behind the US, we, but the, the vaccination is also, also speeding up uh, quite rapidly uh, we have uh, more than 20 percent of the adults which have been vaccinated already and um, we hope to and to to have uh, everybody uh, willing to be vaccinated vaccinated among the adults uh, next summer by the summer the real issue is not uh, in europe or in the us the real issue is in other countries as we see right now and uh, um even if it was not the question, I, 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 I am, I'm glad to, to, to underline that the US and Europe have really to cooperate, not only to, to, get, to give money, but also to share vaccines with uh, a lot of countries which uh, need them, uh, uh, starting with healthcare workers. And we see right now, even very big, uh, big and powerful countries like uh, Brazil, India, and others, face difficulties but you can imagine in less uh, powerful countries in Africa or in Latin America how it is so we need very much to to hand hand in hand to work together US Europe to help to help those countries and to help ourselves actually because if we let variants variants develop in other parts of the world it will be also very bad for our the efficiency of our vaccinations 
Uh, Tatenda has a great follow-up to this, and she asks, um, says, amid this pandemic, there seems to have been some challenges with global collaboration around the pandemic. With the challenges going on in India at the moment and low vaccination rates in Africa, what is you, what do you see as the future of global collaboration? And as more countries in Africa are leaning more and more on China, how do you see the future of the West versus East influence in the world of diplomacy? Well, uh, it's up to us, uh, the West, to uh, show that what uh, we call the vaccine diplomacy is not the right answer to trade vaccines and to uh, uh, with influence. Um, we we should uh, be uh, active enough to to uh, promote the distribution of vaccinations without conditions and uh, only adapted to the. Um, to the technical to the technical to the specificities, for instance, uh, to choose to choose the vaccines which are distributed only uh, in in function of the needs of the country, and based on science and based on uh, on uh, uh, processes which uh, are uh, absolutely uh, objective and which uh, meet uh, the, the needs uh, of the. Of the, of the people who are being vaccinated and uh, of a, a, a vaccine, a cooperative vaccination process which covers all countries. For that, we must be more active in in in, uh, in distributing vaccines. But also, we, we 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 are there is already a lot of money available. But we we must be more active, and we must probably also increase the availability of uh, vaccines through um, tech, technical cooperation and uh, but also through um, uh, the extension the, the of the number of manufacturing sites uh, vaccines must be man manufactured in many many uh, countries if we want to to do this we we have done it in france where we have started to manufacture pfizer biontech and uh, uh, soon Moderna and Johnson and Johnson, but it must be this extension of the number of manufacturing sites must be done also in uh, less developed countries, and for this we must help them. We we would not get rid of this virus uh, immediately, of course. I mean by immediately, I mean this year because we see the new variants. We will need uh, more shots shots at some points, so we need really to. To have in all regions of the world the possibility to react uh, more quickly, and uh, and finally, and don't forget the future pandemics. It is not the last one, and uh, we have to prepare for others, uh, draw, drawing uh, the the right lessons to, from from this one. We have a couple more questions in the queue, but if anyone has any questions, just a reminder to type them into the Q and A box, and we'll we'll ask the ambassador. And our next one comes from Alec. And uh, Alex says, there have been some conversations about the faults of EU diplomacy, some of which are due to the unanimity required among member states on any policy. Some of these faults were on display recently during Joseph Burrell's infamous trip to Russia. How would removing the unanimity clause, as some member states have suggested, impact EU diplomacy? Well, it's a very good question. And by somebody who obviously knows very well the European Union, and follows the European Union carefully. Um, we have a lot of uh, qualified majority decisions here in already in the European Union, in different fields, more rarely in foreign policy, although it is already possible in some cases, but um, the it's it's a, it's a little like uh, in, in in the construction of the United States. Uh, we uh, in the history of the construction of the United States, we we have a uh, to to find the balance between decisions where we uh, have to um, uh, have everybody on board, which means unanimity, and decisions which uh, um, can be taken by a qualified majority because otherwise everything is blocked. So it's uh, something, as you, the, your student uh, says, it's something which is being debated indeed, which has been debated for some years already as in the field of foreign policy, where whether we should uh, switch to more qualified majority voting. Uh, I'm sure it is um, um, 
not easy because foreign policies uh, can be very sensitive. Um, you can have majority quali qualified majority votings, and you can take those decisions, some of those, the most sensitive decisions by qualified majority, but reach a crisis uh, because uh, the, the countries which have been in a minority are really feel really, uh, um, it shouldn't have been done this way. We had one famous decision in the field of migration policies uh, a couple of years ago, and the minority was uh, made of, of Central European countries. We have to, to be cautious on this because qu the qual qualified majority voting is something to make it, the system work. But uh, it must be accepted at the end, even by countries which have uh, been in the minority. So um, it ha it has to be it has to be uh, to be done in a way which enlarge will enlarge more and more the field of qualified majority voting, less and less unanimity, more and more qualified majority, but in a way which is made acceptable to countries not only to accept the qualified majority being extended, but also to be in the minority when uh, it will be, once it will be implemented. It is, uh, it is possible, and I think it is a direction, but uh, we, uh, we have to be uh, careful about it and to do it in a most efficient way. I don't know whether I was clear in my answer, but uh, it, was, uh, it, is, it is also the result of my experience in Brussels. Well, our next question is, going back to the end of the Cold War, the breakup of Yugoslavia and the transition of the Soviet bloc into independent republics fundamentally altered the global map and presented a host of new geopolitical challenges. We know that the end of the Cold War was not, in fact, the end of history. So where and how do you see the global map potentially changing in the next five to 10 years? Wow, very ambitious question. <laughs> or, or I don't know, <laughs> actually. I don't know because it's... Uh... It's a, it's a great question, but uh, it, the, the, the things, are, things are evolving so quickly that uh, uh, I think that if you, if you try to, to foresee uh, things, you, you might end finally to, by, by seeing that it was quite different from what you had uh, forecasted. Uh, and and uh, your student uh, said rightly, mentioned rightly the end of history after the, the fall of the Berlin Wall and uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union and uh, and the the nationalism the, the logic of force of, of uh, uh, everything has came back again and uh, uh, now we are in a very uh, very more brutal more uh, a world which is more dominated by uh, strengths, uh, we say rapport de force in French, how do you say English? Uh, by by, by the, 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 the we, we, it is not at all what we imagined at the, 90, the beginning of the 90s. So uh, I think that one very important issue for the five to 10 next years will be whether in spite of this uh, more, uh, 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 difficult uh, relations we have, uh, and with in spite of the competition between uh, models, especially uh, democracies, authoritarian regimes. For me, the very important question is whether we will try to still cooperate based on the United Nations uh, organizations to face global challenges. I was last uh, Friday in Cape Canaveral for the launch of uh, the new the team of uh, four astronauts to the International Space Station because one of them was Fre is French, uh, Thomas Pesquet. So it was a great thing to be there with the Japanese and uh, two Americans astronaut, two American astronauts. And the station, the International Space Station is also um, uh, Russian, as you know, it was made of uh, Russian and American and European and Japanese elements. We have also a, a, an incredible project in uh, which is based in France, which is uh, to study the what we call the um, nuclear fusion. The, it is the energy of the sun, uh, which is uh, made by everybody there: China, Russia, India, Japan, Korea, the United States, Europe. 
it's a cooperation between all important uh, scientific uh, uh, ca ca countries ha having invested in this field of research. I mean, well, climate is also a good example. Will be will we be able, in spite of our competitions differences? Of course, it is more than an example. It is a survival issue for for all of us. Um, I see the, the 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 biggest question is the next five to ten years whether we will or not succeed to to have an, an efficient international cooperation to um, to face these challenges. Notwithstanding the fact that we will have a, 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 a fierce competition between models and between influences, um, I don't want to, 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 to give the impression we can push aside the, the, the competition, for instance, between China and, uh, and the United States or, uh, or China and democracies. Are, um, of course not, but uh, shall we still uh, shape uh, all of us, uh, the uh, our uh, international relations system in such a way that we can efficiently tackle the, the common challenges or not. This is for me a, a very decisive question for not in for, not for the time in five ten years, but for the time in 20, 30, 40 years. And I, I give some positive examples because to 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 explain where I see the. The most important challenges with space, energy, climate uh, are among those. Uh, Tatenda has, a, has another question, a really good one, I think. With, with Brexit, how do you view the UK EU relations going forward? And additionally, during the Trump administration, there was a lot of talk about US allies being relatively reliant on the US for military support. There was friction around NATO. What do you think is the future of UK, EU, US relations in terms of military coordination? Well, I think that the UK and France have a, a special uh, role because they are nuclear powers, permanent members of the UNSC. Uh, and, but the European Union, as such, as I said before, must be must become stronger, including in the military and security field, to be a, a more reliable, more able uh, partner of the United States. Uh, in in the framework of the Atlantic Alliance, um, as far as the UK is concerned, of course, the Brexit uh, Brexit is a, the result of the decision of the British people, and uh, we regret it, of course. Uh, uh, but it it was a decision which was taken in a referendum, so uh, it had to be implemented, um, and uh, now we hope. I think that the United Kingdom will be, of course, will try to will will be a very active in NATO. Will be very, will remain very active in other frameworks, and we on the side of the European Union, we we are really uh, uh, interested by a, a security uh, partnership between the UK and, and the European Union for the security of Europe, because UK remains in Europe. And I mean, the United Kingdom said that uh, it's, it comes, although I am, I, I don't want to, to speak on, on behalf of another country, but I understand our British friends uh, said that they will continue to be interested by the security in Europe. So there are things to do as what, what I am sure uh, of is that the military and security partnership between the United Kingdom and France, a bilateral one, will remain very strong because we have a, a, those last 10 years developed a, 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 a very strong um, military and security cooperation between the two nations based on a new treaty which was uh, uh, signed uh, 10, 11 years ago, which is a Lancaster House Treaty. So this will remain in any any way, I'm sure, and will continue to develop. Our next question comes from uh, Janet Horn from UVA's French department, and she she asks or says, "I would be curious to hear the ambassador's thoughts on the future of French cultural diplomacy and the importance of such cult cultural efforts to support France's unique role on the world stage, including the future of the French language." I think that France was uh, between the two world wars, the the first uh, Western nation to establish a cultural diplomacy with uh, French cultural institutes uh, all over the world, and uh, it has always been a very important uh, feature of our diplomacy. 
um, it has been developed uh, in different fields. One of them being the higher the con higher education uh, cooperation, which is uh, decided by universities, of course, or, or uh, but uh, which we have been supporting. And Vincent Michelot, uh, Professor Michelot, is uh, in charge of this in our uh, embassy, and uh, it's really uh, important for us. So. Um, uh, another aspect is language, the teach, to teach the French language. Another uh, aspect is the network of French schools we have abroad. Last week uh, in Florida, I uh, um, inaugurated, I visited a new program of a, a new school, a brand new school created in St. Petersburg in the area of Tampa Bay to teach French programs uh, together. But it, it is a French American school, it is not a, a French school. Completely, it's a really French American. So those are the fields of priority which will remain very important for the future, especially the language um, to in uh, the to to encourage uh, learning French. But as part of a vision of uh, the importance of uh, multilingualism, uh, of the importance of the diversity of languages, then. Uh, point two, to develop uh, the relations, the exchanges between students and universities in such a way that we adapt to the digital world, but to restart as soon as possible exchanges in person between French and American universities, which is uh, really important for us. Uh, and I, I read somewhere that the University of Virginia has very good uh, contacts with uh, uh, in, in, political science institutes in, in, in France and including in Paris. Um, and um, third, to have my third point would be to, 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 to explain to you that we try to develop a new, a new uh, exchange of uh, especially of French um, uh, creators uh, I mean, can be artists, uh, architects, uh, uh, writers, poets, expressing the diversity of the French society. Because the, the, in the United States, I don't think you, the people usually, some of them do know our, our country quite well. But most of the of the Americans have, have no occasion, opportunity to realize that France also, the French society has changed very much. So uh, a, a third priority would be for me to bring to the United States a, a number of, uh, of, uh, uh, of interesting uh, um, people from the French cultural scene expressing this new diversity, this new reality of the French society and going to the, the different uh, towns where we have uh, our consulate uh, generals, and uh, because we we have a network here in the United States based on ten big American cities. Mr. Ambassador, I think we're we're about at time, and I just want to say on, on behalf of the Batten School, uh, just thank you so much for your time. As I mentioned, it's been an honor and a pleasure, and thank you to all of those who have tuned in and thank you for, for your questions. But Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for, for taking the time to do this. Well, thank you, Sean. And thank you for uh, being the moderator of this uh, uh, exchange. Thank you very much. And uh, I will be happy to, to visit you or to host you in Washington. I mean, you and uh, the, your dean and uh, all uh, interested uh, visitors from the Great University of Virginia. Thank you very much for your invitation. Thank you so much. Bye.